Sikkim 365 and Baylor Plus have teamed up to bring Baylor fans the ultimate content bundle. You can sign up now for $17.99 a month, a $5 monthly savings, and get instant access to all premium content on both websites. For more information, visit either Sikkim365.com or BaylorPlus.com today. What's up, Baylor family? Welcome into Inside Baylor Sports, the official daily podcast of Baylor Athletics. It's Tuesday, September 24th, and today Grace and I take our first look at Baylor's next football opponent, the BYU Cougars. Uh, Baylor's obviously coming off the brutal loss to Colorado. And on the other hand, BYU is coming off uh, a massive win uh, dismantling Kansas State 38-9. to They're now in the top 25 at number 22, uh, 4-0 on the season, have a a pretty impressive win over SMU as well, uh, especially with SMU's recent win over TCU. Uh, but Grayson, man, like this is one of those games that you say you're it's a home game. You've looked at it from the beginning of the year. You feel like BYU struggled last year. Um, you say this is a game that Baylor needs to win because it helps them to get the bowl eligible. Um, but now, uh, after last weekend, not necessarily because of what Baylor uh, couldn't get done, but what because of what BYU did to Kansas State, kind of a Big 12 favorite in a lot of people's eyes, um, just thrashed them, which is, is a kind of an interesting path to the 38-9 to score. Uh, a lot of unique things, I would say, happened in that game. I know that, that um, BYU scored a fumble return for a touchdown. But, I mean, what do you, when you look at that game uh, between BYU and Kansas State, what do you see differently from BYU than maybe you anticipated beginning the season? So I think the biggest thing from BYU is just they've, I think they've just continued to build kind of what they have built for years now where, you know, their offense line is really good. Their defense line is really good. Their defense in general plays really sound football. Um, You're going to have to beat them. You're going to have to beat win one-on-one opportunities. You're going to have to out athletic them at times. Um, I don't think a recipe for success is just turning around and handing the ball off against them and, um, and trying to just hope and pray that you're going to win up front every single time. Um, I also will say this though about BYU and I know they won on the road at SMU, but in general, BYU has not been very good on the road recently. Um, Last year, They were 0-5 in Big 12 play on the road. Uh, They were outscored by an average of 39-17 to on the road last year. Like, and I know they weren't great last year, but they were so good at home still, even though they weren't that great, they were still awesome at home because they just kill you on the margins. And they did that against Kansas state in this game. They were outgained by what? 120 something yards, uh, but they won the, the turnover battle three to zero, had a defensive touchdown, had a special teams return for a touchdown, won the penalty battle eight to two. Like they did everything they needed to, to win that game. And then the home crowd got involved and Kansas state just completely withered under that kind of pressure. And that kind of run that BYU went on uh, at the beginning of the third quarter, Kansas state just, they couldn't overcome it. And, and BYU squashed them, which is what they do at home. Very often Provo is a very tough place to play as Baylor found out in 2022. And I expect BYU to have a lot of success at home this year. I'm curious if that travels. I know it did against SMU, but I need to see it in big 12 play. I need to see them travel, go to a place, play really sound football and continue the kind of trend that they've been on this year because they've earned this 4-0 start for sure. Yeah, and I think for Kansas State's sake, we Baylor saw that firsthand at Lavelle Edwards Stadium a couple of years ago where that place can just be a nightmare once it gets, you know, starts rolling. Um, I'm not saying that's what happened to Kansas State, but it very well could have. Of Like Baylor's that game against BYU did not end up 38-9. to It was a double overtime game. But you just felt it like it, it was a game that Baylor thought, oh, we're, we're going to win this game. A lot of fans felt that way. And you go there um, and you struggle. That home field advantage is real. Um, and, and I think Kansas State kind of saw that firsthand. I, I don't remember the last time Kansas State played at BYU. If they've ever played there, you might have that number in front of you. But for that particular team, obviously, this is they haven't played there this season. They didn't play there last season. So a uh, very, very interesting outcome in a particular way in, a, in that particular game. And what's interesting is that as you were saying that, kind of the recap of the game. It reminds me a lot of the Baylor Colorado game. Baylor won in a lot of different areas. And you think you look at it on the on the stat sheet 
and it was very similar, except Kansas State lost on the road rather than Baylor going on – excuse me, BYU won at home rather than going on the road and losing at Kansas State in a game that they struck, that they did a lot of things really well, but they couldn't get the victory. It snowballed to a victory at home where Baylor couldn't get it done. So kind of the same paths, Baylor just didn't get it done on the road as Kansas State or BYU got it done over Kansas State at home. Right, right. And, and BYU did this all last year too. Like you go and look back through those numbers, it's like they're outgained almost every game and the, yet they're still having games where they're, you know, really truly beating up on like Texas Tech. I think they beat them by two scores at home last year and and other teams as well. They were just I mean, that's they're really good at home. And so I guess for me it's just one of those things where I wasn't very high on BYU to come coming into the year. I really wasn't. I think I had them going like 4 and 8. Um, they're going to be better than that. They're going to be a bowl team. They'll, they'll at least win two more games for sure. They're going to be tough to beat in Provo. And right now, I think BYU fans probably think they're kind of a dark horse Big 12 contender. And, and maybe, I don't quite believe that, but but maybe. Um, their defense certainly is good enough for that. And they're one of the other teams when we talk about, you know, Baylor being a top five defense in the Big 12. They're another one that I, I think they're a top five defense in the Big 12 as well. Uh, they create a lot of problems. They're very solid. They've been really stingy against the pass this year, which has been really interesting. Uh, teams are only completing 49% of their passes against BYU. Um, part of that is the schedule. Uh, they caught SMU in my eyes at a really yeah. good time when SMU was still trying to figure out who their quarterback was. Um, and Jennings had to come in in that game, was kind of a disaster uh, for the most part in that one. And BYU, to, to their credit, got that done. I would say I didn't have a lot of belief in SMU. Yes, they destroyed TCU this weekend, but I think that was more TCU losing to UCF twice than it was SMU really, you know, destroying them but we'll see maybe smu is really good i think in general though this is one of those show me weeks and prove it weeks for byu but it's also that for baylor it's that same thing right you gotta show it you gotta prove it baylor's got a hold serve at home byu's coming on the road saying hey you know we got an outside shot at making a big 12 championship let's go on the road and show that you know we're for real and show that the doubters from this off season were completely wrong about us and they're very well coached they got a great culture and that stuff travels yeah, so uh, BYU this year is 4-0, as we mentioned. Um, they beat Southern Illinois at home, 41-13, um, to beat SMU on the road, 18-15, to which is a very interesting score, like you mentioned, considering the TCU game, but they were in kind of flux. SMU was in flux at quarterback position at that juncture. Uh, beat Wyoming on the road, 34-14, to and then obviously uh, Kansas State, 38-9. to And now they come to Baylor, to Waco. And, and I think it's an interesting – situation for Baylor because this year I think at this point everyone feels like Baylor's a better team than they were last year they Baylor had the advantage of eight home games last year that they did not take um, advantage of um, this year they have six home games but they have not played a power five program or a big 12 program at home this year so we really like we haven't seen what kind of an amped up Baylor team can do at home so I'm really I'm really interested to see that this weekend um, in in a lot of ways you just mentioned uh, TCU losing to UCF twice. You just hope that this isn't a situation where Baylor comes in and it's like just distraught from last week, a game that they thought for sure they had won. Um, you don't want to see their leadership let them down in that way. I think there's a lot of upperclassmen that will do as much as they can. You hope, hope Dave Aranda uh, can prevent that. But it's going to be a challenge because of the way BYU plays versus what they just saw against Colorado. Another week. And, and BYU is more like Utah than what they face in, in other games. Um, and Baylor's built a little bit differently this year. So I'm anxious to see how Baylor responds. And, you know, you just hope that the crowd shows up and, and can and take advantage of that. And the good news is that you're not chasing, you know, three potential NFL receivers around the field against BYU and an NFL quarterback, a top 10 pick potentially in Shador Sanders um, in that particular offensive scheme. And, and right now you go into this game, Baylor goes into this game, as a three-point favorite, and that's kind of, to me, is almost like a, wait, they're three-point favorites type of line, but Vegas usually knows and has a good idea when they set these things of, of what to anticipate, and I think a lot of that has to do with Baylor's particular defense and the way they play defense, despite what the score against Colorado ended up being in the matchup they have with BYU. Um, and then, obviously, like you mentioned, these road games for BYU have been a struggle um, not that Baylor's played great at home, but these the dynamics change a lot whenever you tra travel halfway across the country and have to play an 11 a.m. kick when it's 
potentially going to be pretty warm versus what you've been doing at home. So Vegas knows something. I just don't know. Uh, there's a lot of question marks about Baylor mentally right now as BYU comes in on the opposite side of the coin and is riding pretty high with a lot of confidence. Absolutely. And I think just kind of big picture for Baylor, if Baylor loses this game, it's going to be very hard to see a path to a bowl game. I mean, just being completely yeah. transparent, you know, I felt like the the at worst start they could have was three and two to make a bowl game. So if you start two and three, um, you're behind on some stuff and then you got to travel to Ames and to Lubbock back to back weeks and that things can really snowball on you. If you don't take care of business, that's why we talked about you got to take care of business at home. You got to find a way. And I, I know it is a little scary that Baylor could show up after the Colorado game and, and maybe just find themselves um, in a situation where they lose twice to Colorado. I, I like to think that won't happen. I'd also like to think, you know, BYU is riding a high after a huge win that they had complete focus on and we're really excited about. So you can kind of look at that two different ways, but I do think in general, I think BYU is actually a really good matchup for Baylor, especially yeah. defense versus offense. I think Baylor's defense should be put in really good situations to have success in this game. Um, they're not going to do a lot different than what Baylor saw the first three weeks of the year. They want to run the football. Uh, they want to use power running schemes. They want to take care of the football. They'll take shots downfield to their receivers who have played pretty well this year, uh, specifically Chase Roberts, really good player. Uh, Baylor fans know him from 2022 because he absolutely killed them during that game. And that was before Chase Roberts really turned into a really good player. Yeah, It took him time. He wasn't even that good in 2022, but he played well last year. And then this year, he's really, really kind of taken that mantle as their wide receiver one. He's been really fun to watch. Really good player. I think the development of Jake Retzlaff, uh, which is the quarterback for BYU, has been very encouraging. Uh, he's thrown for 990 yards, nine touchdowns, only three interceptions, also has 100 yards rushing. So capable runner. I wouldn't call him an elite runner, but he's physical. He'll get you first downs. He'll move the chains and, and has, like I said, taken a big step forward as a passer, which has really helped this offense just kind of stabilize itself. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable looking at this box score for BYU against Kansas State. They win 38-9, to nine, um, but 241 total yards, rushed for 3.1, 3.4 yards per carry, 92 total yards rushing, 149 total yards passing, and you beat Kansas State, uh, the number 13 team in the country, 38 to 9. But then you start looking down the rest of it, and you talk about penalties. Uh, they had uh, Kansas State had eight for 50. The ways that BYU scored, they had a defensive touchdown. Um, they had the, you said, I think, believe a kickoff return for a touchdown, 90 yard punt return, punt. excuse me. Um, and so, like, they, they figured out ways to get it done in that particular game. And, uh, those things can snowball for you at home to give you a lot of momentum. And and you, if you're Baylor, you go into this game. And I thought Baylor really did a pretty good job of this against Colorado was preventing that from happening. Now, Colorado did get theirs offensively with a big play before the half. But overall, they did a pretty good job of not just handing Colorado gifts. Um, and then obviously you talk about the Hail Mary, Hail Mary, if you believe that was a gift or just a, a miracle. Um, but overall, I thought after the Air Force performance, they kind of eliminated those factors um, against Colorado. You really That was good to see them clean that up. Um, but you can't go in this game and just give what I would call a pretty average BYU offense freebies. Um, and, and if you're going to win this game, you can't do that. And so I'm really anxious to see how they match up physically. But, I mean, overall, I mean, you look up throughout BYU's season and they they have not done anything that just scare you. And I think that's the where you get to that – three-point favorite for Baylor, that's what Vegas is looking at. It's like, yeah, they're 4-0, and but this and this and this have happened for them to garner being a favorite in this particular game on the road. So I think you take that as – if you're a Baylor fan, take that as a huge positive. Um, then you also look at that BYU is also missing, missing their top two rushers, um, who they believe are their top two running backs against Kansas State. We're still able to do that. So are they back this week? That could change the dynamic. But overall, like, if you believe in Baylor's defense, which I personally do, I think they're going to be more than capable moving th throughout the season despite giving up 38 points to Colorado. But I think you you better expect a, a solid to very good performance against BYU to get this win, um, despite what your offense does. Like your, your defense could potentially carry you to a victory in this game at home. At least it should. 
Right. And, and I think that that's kind of the area that I'm looking at, right? I mean, even against Kansas State, they had 241 yards of total offense, only 92 yards rushing, 3.4 yards per carry. It was not very good. And, and I mean, yes, I'm not saying that those numbers mattered in the grand scheme of things, but I do think it's important to look at kind of were they successful? Were they having a lot of success running the football and throwing the football? They really were not against Kansas State, but they were just solid. They took care of the ball. They capitalized when they were given opportunities. Um, I did think it was interesting. You know, you look at kind of what they've done this year and um, they've been really good against the run and just really good defensively as as a unit. They've really been awesome against opposing quarterbacks, making them very inefficient, um, which is going to be something to watch. You know, Sawyer coming off of a game where he was around 50 percent. You'd like to see that number creep up to, you know, the 60%, 65% range. But that's a lot to ask, you know, when you're going up against this kind of defense. But the rushing numbers are are the intriguing part to me because Kansas State ran for 228 yards, 5.3 yards per carry. Yes, Kansas State's a better running football team than Baylor, but I do think there is something there. You know, I mean, I do think there is an a- area there where Baylor can maybe take advantage, whether it's Sawyer Robertson using his legs uh, or just the running backs being able to wear down BYU a little bit. Um, this just feels like another game where Baylor should have an opportunity to get around 150 rushing yards, which if you're able to get to that number at home, it gives you a great chance to win. And so I, I'm kind of looking at that because their other games, they didn't give up that many yards. The SMU game, they gave up 117 rushing yards. Um, but I do think Baylor's probably somewhere in the middle in between what SMU was on that day and what Kansas state was on the road, put it somewhere in the middle. Let's just say around 150. I, I think seems about right. So then it comes down to efficiency from Baylor's past game. And that's something that I think we all still have question marks about, but I do think at home, it provides a much safer, more comfortable environment for that offense to really flourish specifically throwing the football. Yeah. I mentioned this in, in our last episode, about Colorado and, and what Colorado did defensively and what Baylor saw on film and how they attacked because they were going vertical at time. And Catron Jackson had the big play. Monterey had the big play. Um, they took, obviously, the Hal Presley pass. They went vertical a lot. So is BYU, BYU going to present those opportunities to go vertical or are they going to do something different? So that, that efficient passing game has the potential to open up. Do they say, we're not going to let you beat us deep because we're not nearly as athletic as you are. We're going to change this up. And, and not, that's not to discredit BYU by any means. I think Baylor has speed that people can be concerned with at this juncture. They, they've shown it plenty of times. Now it's, can they get it involved in the passing game with Sawyer Robertson consistently? Um, so what does BYU do defensively in the passing game? Um, do they say we're going to take away everything short, including the run game, and make you beat us vertically? Or we're going to say, well, we're going to we're going to play back and hang out a little bit and let you have the underneath stuff. And that's when Michael Trigg and Monterey Baldwin, and National Hawkins get involved. And then you hope your running game. Um, what for me personally, like I'm really excited to see what this run game can do moving forward. They didn't have the greatest performance against Colorado rushing the ball with the running backs, but Sawyer Robertson opened up a lot in the rushing game that they didn't necessarily account for. How does that impact game plannings for teams like BYU moving forward? What happens with the offensive line? Because I really felt Colorado kind of took away the running back run. Uh, and they didn't account for the run the quarterback as much, but they said, okay, we're not going to let you necessarily run your running backs. We're going to key in on them and take them away. And then Baylor had to go vertical a lot more. So does BYU take that same that same approach? Does Baylor, Baylor's offensive line get better in a game like this? BYU is going to be tough and physical in the box. And so I'm, I'm just curious to see how Baylor reacts to this, how the, what the, the Jake Spavdahl's game plan comes into. Um, and, and, you know, I'm curious if, as well as that, what Dave Aranda does in the pass rushing, because they do – BYU presents a different potential, but they have not ran the ball nearly as much. Does he feel like he can control the run game of BYU with his front as they are also pass rushing? Do they read run, soft run, read pass, run pass the rusher? Because there, there's that fine line of being able to do both. And in the Colorado game specifically, Baylor showed that ability to control the run game with their front while also passing the rushers as soon as they read it was a pass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think there is a situation where that could be the case. I, I think if you were to look at kind of BYU's offensive line, you know, grades on PFF or just kind of watching them play, I think I would definitely say their strength has actually been in pass protection. I think they've been a lot better in pass protection than they have um, run blocking. And I think that's shown in a different 
in a bunch of different ways, right? I think LJ Martin's their best running back, and he hasn't been available for most of this season. He's missed a couple games. And so if they have him, does that change the numbers a little bit? Maybe. Um, but I think in general, they kind of are who they are, which, you know, they're averaging four yards per carry. Um, that's good. But, you know, I, I basically all their games have just been like their best game was 179 yards rushing against Southern Illinois. Outside of that, they haven't topped 150 yards rushing in a game yet. And so in the other three games. And so I think that leads me to think that Baylor can probably hold BYU to somewhere in between that 100 to 130 range running the football. And if they can do that, again, that gives you success. But then that also allows you to do what you said. And that's kind of pin your ears back and try to get pressure on the quarterback uh, with your pass rushers who are going to be tested in this game a lot. You know, the, the BYU offense line, they got four guys graded uh, 74 to 70 per PFF. They've been graded really well in pass blocking, like really, really well. They got like three or four guys that have been um, awesome in that area. And so I think that's going to challenge Baylor in a different way, kind of more similar to Utah. The problem was in the Utah game, Baylor didn't stop the run quite to the level that I think they're going to need to in this game. Um, yeah. And so if they can do that, I think they're going to give guys like Steve Linton, Jacquez Evans, uh, the interior of the defensive line opportunities to get after the quarterback while also uh, stopping the run and just trying to control things up front. Yeah, and you, and you would expect Dave Randa in this particular game to have a pretty good feel. They faced BYU, uh, I guess, dating back to 21-22, didn't play them last year. So they, they have plenty of tape and plenty of understanding of what they want to do offensively and defensively for the most part. New personnel, obviously we know about Gary Bohannon being there. We thought he might potentially be the starter, uh, but he is not. And I think that it looks like he probably won't play in this particular game, but he is there. And, and Baylor's very familiar with this team and understanding what they do. Uh, dating back for a few years. Um, you know, I, I think Dave Aran is going to want to stop the run first and foremost in this game. Pass rush is going to be part of it. Uh, you want to see Baylor's secondary avoid penalties. That costs them once again, once again against Colorado. They're put on islands at times. Um, underthrown balls actually by Shador led to those. Shador Sanders. Um, those guys need to be more disciplined. Obviously, the Hail Mary was a very difficult, frustrating play. Uh, but you also give credit to them. So I think Secondary-wise, potentially creates – if Baylor's defensive front can limit the run, sets up third and longs, um, BYU's, like we mentioned, is not the most off efficient offensive team. I want to see and need to see turnovers in this particular game. I haven't looked at turnover margins for BYU this year, how well they've protected the ball. Interceptions, I think you mentioned that through three interceptions – they're going to have to make plays at some point in the season for this team to reach its potential. And it's just the flip games, especially at home. You want to win these games at home, you better start getting the crowd into it by getting turnovers that turn into quick points, either directly points or potentially for the offense to set, to set up scores. And um, I want to see that secondary make some plays. They haven't necessarily been – I mean, Shador just – he protects the ball extremely well, right? But they didn't get turnovers against Air Force. Um, they go back to the Utah game. They didn't get turnovers in that game. Tarleton, they had a couple – but overall, man, I, I just there's got to be some of that momentum that carries to the secondary that, that results in more turnovers. And I not that you can scheme those in. The, obviously, you can't scheme turnovers in. But by being aggressive in the front and letting those secondary players make plays, uh, it's going to come sometime if you keep, keep rushing the passer. But in this game specifically, you want to get those at home to flip the momentum or gain momentum early in the games. And I do think there will be opportunities for that. I, I don't think Retzloff is some perfect quarterback. He's going to give you opportunities to make plays on the football. Um, and he'll take some shots. He'll take some risks occasionally. Not often, but occasionally he will. Um, and so, again, you'll have chances to for strip sacks. You'll have chances for interceptions. I, I think, in general, though, Baylor just has not been very aggressive in pursuing those they haven't really been you know stripping the football very at a very high rate they haven't been you know getting their hands on passes you know it hasn't felt like they've been dropping a bunch of interceptions it, it really hasn't felt like that and so that has to change and unfortunately um it, it's just one of those things that's really tough to change throughout the season it, it feels yeah. like it it's one of those things that's kind of built in your dna and it before the season, um, we'll see if that changes. You know, there, there's a little bit of time left, but if the sample size goes, you know, three or four more games, then it's probably just kind of wishful thinking at that point. Cause that's just, that feels like how turnovers sometimes are. Um, we'll see on that. I think, you know, in general about BYU, just really quick defensively, uh, they are so old. 
they are so old on the defensive yeah. side and they're pretty old on the offensive side as well. But like you look at their depth chart, you look at the guys that play meaningful snaps. It's so, almost all of them are seniors and juniors. I think they start one sophomore and it's actually probably their best defense player in Harrison Taggart. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of, you know, Tyler, Tyler Batty would probably be like, I'm the best defense player, but you know, they got a few guys that are really good. Jack Kelly is also really a, a good player, but their depth in my eyes, their depth up front where you're rotating, you know, seven, eight seniors up front on the defensive line is just really hard to compete with and hard to contend with. That's what makes them stay so fresh up front and they're counted on. They're able to have that second unit come in and they feel great about it. And and that is really special to have. And that's what I think has made them so difficult to score on. It's just they constantly have fresh legs on the field and they constantly have veterans on the field, even when their top guys are replaced. Uh, it, it's really a, a cool kind of dynamic there for them on that side of the ball. And as we know, BYU is always old, uh, but this year it feels like they're specifically very, very old. Yeah, it's a it's a game where you – I don't know what the over-under is right now, but the way this game sets up, you kind of feel like this is a game where there's going to be a, a defensive struggle in a lot of ways. You hope Baylor can break through and, and score a flurry of offensive points or maybe some special teams points, which leads me to special teams. Um, I haven't looked at BYU specifically with special teams, but I think in a lot of games you feel like Baylor should have the upper hand um, because of their punting situation, because of what we've seen from punt and kick returns. Um, and in close games, hidden yardage is important. So is there anything you could tell us specifically about, about BYU special teams and how they're looking this particular season? Yeah, Will Farron is 15 to 15 on extra points and then six of eight on field goals. So he's been good. A uh, punting game, they actually have two guys that have been punting. Um, so I I don't know if it's a situation where they've had injuries or whatnot, but uh, Sam Vanderhaar has been their punter. He's averaging 42 yards per punt. So solid. Um, I w- there's nothing elite about this, but I do think in general they're solid there and they're a really well-coached team. And so I'm not exactly worried about them. Farron was their kicker last year. He was 11 of 14 on field goals. Um, so solid. 32 of 33 on extra points. So I would say they're solid there, not elite, but I will also say they got that punt return touchdown that if it wasn't for Shador Sanders, Hail Mary, it probably would have been the play of the week in the big 12. It was spectacular. It was really fun to watch. And you just see him running down the sideline in the BYU crowd, just the volume just getting louder and louder as he's about to get to the end zone. That was a really fun play. So they'll take advantage of you. If Baylor's not ready on that side of the ball for whatever reason, because they have been all year long, if they're not ready, though, BYU will, they'll take advantage of that. And that could be a dynamic where, you know, if Baylor has an off game special teams, it could cost them. You would hope it doesn't at home, um, but it's a possibility. Yeah, <clears throat> it's it's a fascinating matchup for a lot of reasons. And I, I'm going to go back. You mentioned the the potential play of the week in the Big 12. I think there was a few of them in the Colorado game. Monterey Baldwin one really stands out, um, and then obviously Jamal Bell's kickoff return. But I, I'm I'm just like you talk about dynamic teams, and I think Baylor's de- evolved into a, a certain degree of dynamic. We've seen some plays in in particular instances against Colorado. I hope that progresses, and I think they're going to need it this weekend. Um, you know, I, I just we talk about six wins at home. Six games at home turn into six wins. It starts this week for Baylor. Um, and, and you want BYU to come in and, you know, you want this game to set up as a win for you. And if it doesn't, you're looking at two, the next two weeks, very tough games against Iowa State, against Texas Tech on the road. Um, that's not ideal if you can't get this game done. So I'm really, I'm really anticipating, I'm anxious for this game from a standpoint of viewing it from Baylor, a Baylor lens. Um, because it's going to tell us a lot about the rest of the season, ultimately, potentially the future of the program. Yeah, it absolutely will. You mentioned, you know, it, the over under is 45 and a half. So they're expecting a low scoring game. Baylor's a three point favorite. They opened as a two and a half point favorite, but, you know, Baylor's a field goal favorite at home right now, you know, going into this game. The over under is expected to be low. So kind of a, a slug fest type thing. And, and, you know, maybe that's how Baylor wants to play. You know, maybe that's also how BYU wants to play. So I'm curious how that kind of dynamic works because neither one has been crazy explosive offensively. But I think in general, just kind of what this game really boils down to, I think is once again, it, it feels like it's all about Baylor. I think if Baylor plays a really good football game at home, they should be able to come out of this game with a win and a, a win that is very much needed and a win that this 
program not only needs, but the culture of the program, the players inside that locker room, they need they need a win. And, and you got to win at home. And the fans have been craving a big win at home in a big-time game. And that's what they're getting. I mean, BYU is the number 22 team in the country. They're 4-0. This is a ranked opportunity, and Dave Randis had some success against ranked teams uh, during his tenure. We'll see if they can get it done this week. And I, I think in general, though, this is a huge one. And like, like I said, I do believe that if Baylor loses this game, I don't think they're making a bowl game. So that's how much importance I have placed on this game and for Baylor to come out winning this game and coming out playing their best football of the year uh, should be, honestly, the expectation. Yep. Potentially a must-win game. So we will we'll ultimately see. Should be a busy week this week, a lot of news. Uh, but in general, I just look forward to more content from Inside Baylor Sports. Um, we Grayson won't be here with us the rest of this week. He has a short trip visit, so we'll have a lot more. Jerry Hill will be on with us, so make sure to tune in for that episode on Wednesday. Uh, and we'll have a couple of player coach interviews. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode of Inside Baylor Sports, the official daily podcast of Baylor Athletics. As always, thank you. Thanks to each of you for listening. Uh, to all the BYU fans who tune into this one, we, we look forward to having you around this week. For Grace and Grunhafer, I'm Colt Barber. Have a great Tuesday in Sick and Bears. Sick and Bears.